I started painting very late in life. I had never touched a pencil or brush before. The moment when I had the first dream about my childhood, which I had forced myself not to recall for many years. Every morning after that, I try to reproduce on paper the things that emerge from the depth of my memory. At night, it was as if some unknown force guided my hand. I lived most of my life in the United States, but the images that appear on paper were all about the faraway country which had denounced me and cruelly eliminated people who gave me my life. I was born in a country blessed with banai nature, but cursed with a tragic fate. It has been only 20 years since Ukraine got into independence. And before that, it proud and sincere people were under domination of either Western or Eastern neighbors. For the last 70 years before independence, the country was a part of the communist country. It was during just that time when people starved to death on the land known for its fertile soil, which was able to provide half of the world with bread and meat, milk and wine. It was a man-made famine orchestrated by the communist authorities to subjugate the nation of free farmers where only in 15 months over 10 million people perish by slow starvation. Nowadays, the memorial has been built in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, to commemorate this unprecedented tragedy in the history of mankind. Its alarm bell ring and remind their life that 10 million people were excruciatingly Virtue, true starvation. At the entrance, there is sculpture of a small girl. She's nearly the same age as I was at that horrible time. She even looks like me, and I would not be surprised if her name were also Zhenya. Мишко Іван, Леса Капікола, Кравченко Ольга, Лежна Настя, Литвиненко Михайло, Соко Кругик, Кравчина Окса, Бойко Варенчова Сильна. That day I was looking for the memorial cross that named the village of my parents, though I do not yet know where and when they found their eternal peace. They, as well as thousands of Ukrainian villages, disappear without trace in the whirlwind of the communist cruel fight against their people. I remember how armed people arrived at our village. I remember very big man with a large revolver protruding from his waistband. That man wanted people to be afraid of him. He came to dispossess my father of his own land and make it the property of the state. At the time, I didn't understand that. 
I did not understand the unknown strange words, collectivization, kulak, or arrest. But like any child, I felt the fear and despair of grown-ups, for they were deprived of what had belonged to their families for ages, land, plots, which were passed from father to son for many generations. They were robbed not only of their land plots, but their fatherland was taken from the people very often along with their life. Several years ago, near the genocide communities for all regions of Ukraine installed memorial crosses to commemorate their perished compatriots. And I was hoping to find the cross from my small village there too. I was met by the already familiar bronze girl. The rays of the morning sun were sparkling on the wheat crafts in her hands. And all of a sudden I remember I used to wake up to the gentle touch of a large, rough palm. Wake up, daughter. The sun has risen, and warm lips would lightly touch my forehead. I knew my father had been up already for several hours. We own a large plot of land, and the land requires a lot of care and back-breaking labor. Hard work had been the second nature of every villager for many generations. And my father was proud he could provide for his family with his own labor on his own land. He was happy. And the feeling of his light-hearted contentment embraced each of us in the family. Everything came to an end in the fall of 1929. The villagers' independence frightened the Soviet authorities, and Ukraine started getting covered in crosses. That morning, I felt neither his touch nor his kiss. It was the first time that I woke up by myself. My father has been arrested and taken away. He did not resist. They took away from me the person who used to be my embodiment of security, courage, strength, and love. I started to cry. Then I did not know yet, and could not know, I was standing on threshold of a new way of life, which would eventually take me to this strange world. I would see my nat native land only in my dreams, and many years later, they would find their way out in the form of drawing of strange images of a half-forgotten child impression.
That day, I was looking for reconciliation with the past. I visited my native village several times, but I had never been in the neighborhood where my parents' house had stood, where I was born, and where my mother had sung to me lullaby for the last time. Probably, I had been subconsciously afraid to feel the despair which I had suffered in my childhood, and for decades, I had been trying to forget and erase from my life. But that day, I went there. I walked on foot across the field. It might have been the same field my mother and I had been using so we wouldn't starve. Mother would look for a frozen rye ears under the snow and pass them to me. I would put them together carefully, trying not to drop a single seed and must have looked very similar to the girl at the genocide memorial. Museum. Early the next morning, policemen came to our home. Mother was accused of stealing state property and was arrested. They stripped the house of everything that had survived father's arrest. They even took my mother's wedding ring. I remember when my mother was arrested. My elder sister and I saying goodbye to her at the police station. I felt mother's look at me. She did not cry, just watched. But her eyes were filled with so much pain and sadness and immense love. I wanted to rush to her, but the policeman ordered my sister to take me away immediately. I never seen my mother again. I don't know where she is buried. Authorities used to keep the fate of their prisoners secret. I find the neighborhood silent, with empty houses. Many people were arrested. Most people had abandoned their native places, homes and many move closer to the cities. Many die from starvation in the villages. The desert was like the ruined world of my childhood. Back then, the collective farm was organized in the villages, but people were reluctant to work on the field, which did not belong to them. For this, the communists took away the entire harvest of the village, down to the last seed. Those who resisted were executed on the spot. Famine broke out in the fall. It was then that my mother had to go to the field to look for frozen vegetables. Wheels cracked behind me, I shuddered. A familiar village cart went by, and of all sudden, I realized what scared me so much. One of the darkest memories from my childhood stood before my eyes. Almost every day before dawn, so that nobody would see a cart move along the street to collect the dead bodies of those who die of starvation. There was such a cart in every village. I often see that harvest of death in my dreams. 
a dream how the car stopped. The driver put a dead body on it and slowly drive on to the next house. And I remain standing numbly, gripped by cold, numbing fear. I stopped near one of the houses. An elderly man who stood there had probably also witnessed those horrible events and lived with the same fears as I do. He could be the boy who lived next door and with whom we played together and our mothers cooked dinner for us together. It seems to me that I even recognize him but I did not dare approach him. I could not find courage, the courage to face my memories. In the evening, I sat at the large family table, just as I had done many years ago. The house was very familiar to the one our family used to live in. And the atmosphere, it was just like affectionate and wholesome, as my mother's had always cultivated in our family. People around me were not my close relatives but I suddenly felt that my mother and father were also there next to them. It was the feeling of one family in perfect harmony. I listened to a song which my mother used to sing to me, as well as her mother to her. I thought that it had been like that from time immemorial and should be like that forever. That day, I was looking for the place where my guardian angel had covered me with his wings and had not let my small child's heart to harden. During the horrible time of genocide, my elder sister, Natalia, became my guardian angel. He and Key of Petersk Lavra the largest Ukrainian monastery. 
Natalia and I spent some hardest times of our lives. Famine has already raged in villages, while in Kiev there was some hope for salvation. We got away just in time. Several months later, the armed units closed down the ways to large cities and villages could not escape famine dead. We found refuge in a very small room where monks lived before in Kiev. Many of them had managed to flee. Many had been arrested and shot. The country was becoming atheistic. Believers who lived next to us spoke in a whisper how communists were destroying the churches, throwing down the bells, and torturing the priest. Later, I understood that genocide, Holodomor, had been a part of the large-scale war against the Christian moral. For a person who loves God turned into a piece of dirt, from which the authorities could not easily mold into a new docile Soviet citizen. During that molding process, hundreds of thousands lost the right to live as rejected material. This became especially evident when famine got to Kiev. At that time, Natalia succumbed to starvation and malaria. I failed to find the house where we had to live, but I recognized the building of the former food store where bread rations were distributed. I remember endless lines and fights when hungry people simply lost their human dignity. Naturally, we as disposed kulaks did not have access to those bread rations. And there was no way to earn our living for the people in the city. They did not want to communicate with us. Authorities used to tell them that peasants were to blame for famine that had gripped the country. Communists had learned the slogan, divide and rule well and amply sought mistrust, disbelief in people's souls. The hospital did not want to risk and admit the daughter of enemy of the people. So Natalia was quietly dying at home. I wonder about Lavra Monastery, looking for food and amid some weed grass, feeling completely useless and already was about to hate the entire world. Once I found myself near the bread store again, a woman who received her ration came forth from the crowd. She noticed me, came up, and without a word, gave me a small piece of bread. I wanted to swallow it immediately, but suddenly remember about my ill sister. I never saw that woman again but I will remember her face for the rest of my life. Now I understand that along that small piece of bread, she gave me faith and hope for the future. I brought the bread to Natalia. Surely that didn't save her life, but I felt it saved my soul. Somewhere in the distance, I heard the chime of the memorial ringing from Lavras Monastery bells. I listened and thought that even genocide, Holodomor, had not managed to kill God in people's hearts. For as long as there was at least one person ready to share it pitiful food with the neighbor, 
the authorities were powerless. But those horrible times must not be forgotten. That is why the difficult reconciliation of my childhood must be written and heard again and again. That day, I was trying to find a sense of peace, but found my thoughts in the storm of political passion. A public rally was in full swing on a square near monument to Taras Shevchenko in Kiev. Passionate speeches urged people to be careful because the removed tumor of Bolshevism could regenerate. The rally brought together the famous poet Metro Pavlichko and a known student, some old people and young activists of the National Democratic Movement. People stood under the same colors, which many years ago, on the same spot, Risha Sakevich, my brother, a student of the Art Academy, protested against the communist regime. He was one of my four brothers whose destinies reflected the inhuman essence of that terrible epoch. The eldest brother, Yasha, was the first one to leave the family. I never understood why he worked at the mines in the Ural Mountains. Yasha used to be fond of machinery and had a talent for engineering. But in all likelihood, he went there, not of his own will. He did not even receive a state-provided food ration and lived in misery. When he came back to Kiev, to Ukraine, he could not find any job for a long time. Later, hearing the word exile, I always thought of Yasha, my oldest brother. The middle brother, Havriel, wanted to become a cavalry officer and went to study at military academy. After our father has been arrested, they announced that Havriel would be dismissed as son of rich peasant, Kulak, as they say, and those an enemy of the people. At the time, those stigma virtually erased the person from a life. My mother tried to help and even managed to obtain documents from the police proving that we had already been dispossessed of all our possessions, but that was not enough. The director of the academy demanded him in public to denounce his father, Gabriel, say no, and was dismissed after all. He died at 26 of tuberculosis, for the doctors were afraid to help children of the enemies of the people. I learned all that much later from Risha, my brother. I look at the faces around me and try to imagine Risha and several hundreds of other young Ukrainian intellectuals who had dared to protest back then in the spring of 1930. All of them were severely beaten up, arrested and convicted. The Soviet authorities used to be afraid of educated people, 
because they could not be turned into slaves. The communist regime molded a new person without dignity, without faith, without motherland. What communists needed was a slave without memory about its nation, and they nearly succeeded in it. I told about that distant protest on the same square to Dmitro Pavlichko, poet, and he smiled bitterly about the strange play of fate. I listened to the famous poet and thought that they had not broken my brothers after all, but they still had not become what they could. And it is quite possible that the country had lost a prominent engineer, a brave officer or gifted artist, and one more loss. To save my younger brother, Mikola, from disdain and famine, my family decided to hide him in orphanage. That gave at least some hope for his future. They taught him to pretend to be an orphan and change his documents. And so he died on the false name. In the meantime, passions on the square continue. The young and independent Ukraine was looking for its way to future. The future without concentration camps, blood or famine. Мишко Іван Лесок Пеку, Кравченко Ольга Пеку, Настя, Литвиненко Михайло, Соко Кровик Катрина, Бойко Мажинко Василь, Антоненко Федось, Федерченко Андрій, Бабенко Олексій Дніпровський, Мишко Іван, Кравченко Оловик, Литвиненко Михайло, Кровик Катерина, Царенко Василь, Федерченко Петро Марія, Дніпровський Сергій, Кучка Семен, Кривород Полюдімин, Барабаш Уляр, Чотинський Шин. That day I was looking for a place where I had found the last refuge of my childhood, an orphanage. Somewhere at the end of 1936, my brother Risha took me to a small city not far from Kiev with the poetic name Bila Tserkva, White Church. Being politically unreliable, my brother was not allowed to live in a large cities. He registered with the local police and started looking for a job. It was not an easy thing because people were afraid to associate with an enemy of the people, and our miserable savings were running low. While Hrisha was looking for at least some earning, I roamed about the city street, being always hungry. One day I met a woman who took pity on me and fed me. Since then, I often drop to her place and play with her cat. Her neighbors told me to steer away because that woman, during the famine, she ate her husband. How could I understand at 10 years old what those people warn me about? Only later I learned what cannibalism is and understood I play at the place of mad, low-spirited woman. But she was good to me. A month later, my brother ran out of money and we had no means to live on. It was then when Hrisha dared to send me to the orphanage. I was now looking for its building. It was a real challenge for the city. It had completely changed. The only thing which reminded about the past was the communist idol that remained standing on the central square as if a stone fragment of that horrible time. Thank you.
all of a sudden I heard sound of music and subconsciously following the sound I find myself at the traditional holiday, the last school bell. School leavers were heading for grown-up life, making room for younger generation, the eternal flow of life. The school building was in no way similar to the old orphanage, but I stay for something held me there and did not let me go. I remember what I had to say about myself when he took me to the police station and ordered me to sit down on the stairs and wait for somebody to see me. They picked me up, interrogated for a long time, I think that policemen understood everything, but made appearance they believe my story. Eventually, I was admitted to an orphanage and sent to school. My childhood was over. Risha secretly visited me, but such a meeting was very risky. If somebody had learned that I had a brother, I would have been thrown out immediately of the orphanage and Risha would have gone to jail. The sound of bells ringing distracted me from recollection. The girl with the bell was probably as old as I had been back then. She even looked similar to me. I had a feeling that the bell carried the echo of church bells at my parents' wedding and the chimes of Kiev Lavra and the mournful bell sounds of the Museum of Genocide Holodomor, which will always beat the alarm. I peered into young face too serious for a child and suddenly realize, now I know for sure the name of the girl at the memorial. Her name was Marichka, Ohrunka, Ksenia, Anusia, Olenka, and of course, Zhenia. She has a large family, all of us, including those who live on this blessed soil and those who were dis dispersed all over the world. She is our immortal soul. Immortal for soul cannot be deprived of fate, neither shot nor starved to death. That is why all of us, the dead, the alive, and the unborn are also eternal, just as every nation in the world. And my family has always been and always will be a small part of this nation. Blood of blood, flesh of flesh, 